College football season is here, and we'll be exploring what the first year of conference realignment is going to look like. Plus, the NWSL announced its new CBA, and it's a deal that will transform the league in some pretty fundamental ways. It's Friday, August 23rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're looking ahead to the start of college football season, first with our newsletter writer David Rumsey, looking at some of the more recent stories in that space, and then taking a wide-angle look with Ben Stevens of SportsGrid. Our reporter Margaret Fleming provides the details on the NWSL's new agreement with its players, which sets it apart from every other major U.S. league. First, let's hit some headlines. The details of the NWSL's new CBA came out late Tuesday night and feature improved player mobility, higher salaries, and an interesting wrinkle, the elimination of a player draft. The agreement is set to run through 2030. More on that later. Cristiano Ronaldo is now the owner of one of the fastest growing YouTube channels in history, at least in its first two days. The international star launched Cristiano on Tuesday, and at the time of this recording already has 25 million subscribers. He launched 12 videos from the jump, and three have already eclipsed 12 million views. The channel reminds you to see you subscribe, a reference to a signature celebration. The longest tenured coach in college football has been suspended for a game. Iowa's Kirk Ferentz, who has coached the team since 1999, was issued a suspension for violations over their recruitment of starting quarterback Cade McNamara from the University of Michigan. It's not yet clear if the suspension comes from Iowa or the NCAA. As we wait on updates for whiteout star contracts like CeeDee Lamb and Jamar Chase, A.J. Terrell becomes the second highest paid cornerback in NFL history, signing a four-year extension with the Atlanta Falcons worth $81 million. $65.8 million is guaranteed, according to friend of the show Ian Rappaport. ACC Commissioner Jim Phillips said on Tuesday that the conference is going to fight the lawsuits against the ACC by Clemson and Florida State, who are attempting to leave the conference without paying exit fees, which could be anywhere from $140 million to $572 million with TV rights factored in. The National Women's Soccer League just announced its new collective bargaining agreement with its players union and will not just improve player pay and conditions, it will radically change how teams operate and allow for strategies that are not available in other major U.S. leagues. My colleague Margaret Fleming breaks it down for us next. Joined now by breaking news reporter Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Hi, Owen. Hey, great to have you on. So the NWSL has announced its new collective bargaining agreement with its players. It's fairly transformative. So let's go through the big pieces. Um, it's a bunch of places we, we could start here, but let, let's just start with the money. So the, the money is increasing. So um, if you could just take us through kind of, yeah, what, what kind of increases we're going to see for players in the NWSL. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. So right now, the average salary in the NWSL is somewhere around $56,000. The minimum is thirty-five. dollars uh, Starting in 2025, that salary cap per team is going to bump up to $3.3 million. So based on how many players are on your team, that'll be between $135,000 and $159,000 for that average salary. Um, so again, in between 135 and 159, that's a lot more than 56. So again, it's, it's nowhere near some of the levels we see in other sports, but, um, for the NWSL, this is a really, really big jump. Um, and, and will be really exciting for these players and, um, the salary cap will increase every year. And then also it can, um, as more, you know, media rights come in, um, It'll be at least two hundred thousand dollars from revenue sharing, which is the first time they're ever doing, you know, media and corporate revenue sharing in the NWSL is with this contract. So, as those go up, um, especially if they get a new media deal, um, that would greatly increase player salaries as well. So, by the time we get to twenty thirty, the cap is at five point one million, up from three point three. So again, that's a big jump. And then you add in that media. By the time that this deal runs out in twenty thirty, if they don't renegotiate it by then, the player salaries would be, you know. A lot bigger than they even are going to be in 2025 right and so they, yeah they've got the base salary which is going to be 3.3 million next year up to 5.1 in 2030 when this when this deal runs out um and yeah and then there's uh, a portion of the media and sponsorship revenue that the league gets go will add on to that salary cap and uh so obviously the the current big media deal that they're on is is going to be a big factor but this next deal will include at least the first part of a new media deal. So that's going to, you know, be a huge factor for the, the league and the players. Yeah. And I mean, we're saying that at the same time, the deal that they're currently on right now 
was ratified in 2022 and it's two years later. So, you know, yeah. they could, and that was, in, you know, prompted by the league. It wasn't prompted by the players union. So they could, you know, go ahead and, and get a new one by that time as well. Sure. But, um, but that's what it looks like right now. Yeah. Um, and there's also some pretty interesting stuff around player movement. So the, the draft is gone. The expansion draft is gone, which will be interesting because there will be expansion teams at some point. Um, so yeah, take us through, um, yeah, how, how player movement is going to be different going forward. It's going to be very different. It's going to be very different. Like you said, no entry draft, no expansion draft, no trades without players' consent. Um, and all players are going to be free agents once their contracts are up. So like current players locked into contracts, whatever, every new one is going to be a free agent at the end of it. So um, yeah, it's going to look very different. Basically, what's going to happen is when you come out of college now, you'll talk to your agent, you'll talk to your college coach, and you'll kind of figure out which market you want to play in, um, which is going to be very different than showing up for a draft. In many ways, I mean, a draft is sort of like a big moment and like a really exciting time, um, you know, a big tradition. But um, I spoke with the president of the Players Association last night, Tori Huster, and she was explaining how there's a lot of anxiety around it as well. She said, you know, at one point in her career, she was drafted and then, um, you know, less than two weeks later, the league folded entirely and, you know, you don't know where you're going to go. There's a lot of anxiety around it. And so this eliminates a lot of those factors and lets players find the best team for them and the best place for them to play, um, what's going to be the best spot for them. And so um, it's definitely an interesting model. Um, it's very weird to wrap your mind around it if you're an American sports fan, because we are used to drafts. It's a, it's a, more common thing in other countries um like the premier league for example they don't have a draft you join a club when you're you know a youth they're coming up in the system um, and then you stick with that club throughout and so trades are a lot less common in that as well compared to the american system but um yeah so it kind of they they call it the commissioner called it aligning with global standards um so moving a little bit more in that direction so uh it's going to be a weird mix of kind of this european american because we still have college systems here and whatnot but um it's going to look a lot different and it's going to give players a lot more agency over where they go you know who they want to play for um what market they want to be in you know if you want to play in your hometown you know again if they don't have roster spots they don't have whatever it might be a little bit of a different situation but um you should have a lot more agency free agency literally of where you want to go yeah I mean, we shall see exciting times we live in margaret fleming thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me on on wednesday the oakland ballers opened up their crowdfunding campaign in which anyone can purchase a piece of the team the initiative is an intentional contrast from the oakland days who are in their final weeks of playing in the city because long story short John Fisher decided that it was more important that he continue to own the team than it was for them to stay in Oakland. Ballers co-founder Brian Carmel said in a statement announcing the funding campaign that Oakland is just the latest example of a systemic problem with how pro sports teams are run in the United States. Team owners often hold fans hostage, demanding public money for new stadiums, and if they don't get it, they move the team to a different city that's willing to pay up. Fans can buy in for as little as $170. At the time of recording, the Ballers have raised just under half a million dollars. Colorado University's special teams coordinator, Trevor Riley, resigned at the beginning of this month and on his way out, stated that he engaged Saudi Arabia's public investment fund in his search for money to support the program. In his resignation letter, Riley wrote, you paid me $90,000 a year and let me handle special teams. I did all this work in your name and was told to pursue it. I burned through all my contacts in my Mormon community, which is worth about $3 trillion. Now I can't get these people to answer my calls because I found out today that none of my endeavors will happen. I even went to Saudi Arabia and got a meeting with the Saudis who are interested in pursuing business. I have email receipts to prove it, and you guys let it fall flat on its face. The BIF, of course, is all over sports already with huge investments in golf, soccer, and tennis, among others. But Middle Eastern money has not made its way into college sports the way it has for many pro leagues. With athletic programs now looking for money in every way they can think of, it may only be a matter of time. Week zero of college football season starts tomorrow. My colleague David Rumsey is on top of all the latest developments in the CFB world, and he joins us next. I'm joined now by front office sports newsletter writer David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Great to be here. Great to have you. So uh, college football season is upon us. We have week zero this weekend. Um, what, are you, uh, what are you just noticing about the week zero game so far? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it seems like uh, it was just NFL draft season or even farther back than that, March Madness. But here we are. It's uh, college football week zero, the Saturday before Labor Day weekend uh, coming up. And it's interesting this year we have four games in this uh, quote unquote week zero. But uh, that's down from previous years. Last year, we had seven games involving FBS schools. And the year before that, in 2022, we had about a dozen games involving FBS schools. So schools are starting to not get on the trend quite as much. But uh, one school that is always playing is Hawaii. And if you want to learn more about that, we have a nice story on that in this morning's uh, front office sports newsletter. But I think the big game of the week is uh, Florida State, Georgia Tech over in Ireland. And obviously, Florida State's a highly ranked team and the huge story last year going undefeated and not getting selected for the college football playoff, which is expanding to 12 teams this year. So we have a, a lot to get into for this college football season. Yeah, absolutely. And just briefly on Florida State, it seems like so they, they've got this lawsuit along with Clemson to try to uh, leave the ACC without paying any of the, the enormous exit fees that are in their contract. Right. Um, yeah. Do we know anything new about that? Or are we pretty much status quo there? Yeah, we've been trying to follow every twist and turn and every uh, court case and legal battle. And our college uh, sports expert colleague, uh, Amanda Kristovich, has been following a lot of that at front office sports as well. So she's on top of that. But really coming into this season, uh, there, there's nothing new. You know, Florida State and Clemson are still in the ACC, which has added some teams a, a lot like the other conferences in the nation. Uh, Florida State would really like to leave. I think Clemson would too. And there's uh, counter lawsuits between the schools and, and the conference. And this week, Jim Phillips, who's the commissioner of the ACC, was uh, confirming, you know, we're going to fight this and we're not going to let them leave without, you know, if they, Florida State could leave, let's be clear, but it would cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's it's been a, a black eye for college football, I would say. Uh, this summer, but we're here now. And I think that will maybe die down a little bit with the game starting. Yeah. Yeah. I think once there's, there's football to watch a lot of this background stuff, you know, goes to the background. Let's hop over briefly to um, the Alabama, you know, they just signed their GM Courtney Morgan to a record setting deal. Uh, do you see that as maybe a, the start of a trend of, you know, GMs, you know, maybe as recruitment, you know, gets more and more, uh, I mean, it's always a, a huge focus, obviously, but taking on a, a new layer in the NIL and, you know, players getting paid era. Um, you know, what'd you make of, of Courtney Morgan getting this, this record salary? Yeah, I think it's definitely a trend that's going to continue. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, another GM at a different school breaks that record um, this year or next year, you know, he, uh, Courtney Morgan was getting got bumped up from $500,000 a year to over $800,000 a year uh, just this week. And of course, he came over with Kalen DeBoer from Washington, who is now the head coach of Alabama after Nick Saban retired. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I think GMs in college football have been around for, for several years, especially if you're uh, kind of a college football insider or a huge fan, you, you know about these guys, but they're definitely becoming more important as there's a lot more scouting to do in season uh, between like these players become available in the porter portal as soon as the season is over and you can go sign somebody from your rival or a different conference. And that just wasn't the case previously when you had to sit out a year if you were going to transfer. So it's definitely much more like the pro game with free agency. And yeah, I think that's why you need somebody uh, aside from just your coach who's worried about recruit recruiting and who's worried about the, the game at hand, but somebody to say, Hey, this guy, this uh, defensive back over uh, in California, you know, he wants to transfer and this is how much we can give him. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very important job and it makes sense that uh, those guys are getting paid more money. Yeah, right. And I think I was thinking about how the, the shifting role of the coach or just like there's more for the coach to do because obviously they're the coach, but they were also kind of the GM in years past. Yeah. Uh, or like they were the ones like looking for players, scouting those players, recruiting them. And yeah, there's just more to do, especially in season now. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see college front offices that resemble, you know, pro front offices more. Absolutely. I think you're spot on. Um, and let's just briefly hit on the sort of funny situation out in Oklahoma State. So uh, we had Mike Gundy kind of railing against IL saying like, you know, let's just get to the football. This is the good part. Um, and, but also 
we're going to have QR codes on our helmets. So um, if you, you know, and you're watching on TV and you want to send us some money, you just hold up your phone. Um, not sure how much help motor there's to say about that, but you know, it is, it's kind of just a sign of the times, I guess. Yeah. It's the wild world of college football that we're living in now, you know, QR codes seem to kind of uh, maybe had their day and kind of come and gone, right. They used to be this novel technology and now they're just kind of like what you use to scan the, for your menu at a restaurant or something. But yeah, I think it's more symbolic of like, Hey, we need money and we are willing to accept your money in any way possible and get you to be aware that we need this money in any way possible. And if you're a school like Oklahoma state, you surely have, you know, some big donors and, you know, you're not lacking for cash, but you're not at that top, top echelon of like a Texas or an Alabama of, you know, really bringing in that money. So, and that, that's what it's about. Just like we were talking about with schools, having uh, GMs that are getting paid all this money to go recruit these players, scout these players that might come over. And that's, that's really what that NIL money is used for. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to see like more weird gimmicky things to try to bring in more money, you know, as, you know, as players are getting paid and they, they've built out their front offices and it should be interesting to watch. David Rumsey, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks. Nike is facing tough competition from smaller, more nimble brands like On and Hoka, but it is making a move to win over kids from an early age. The sneaker and apparel giant is teaming up with Lego on co-branded content and experiences on a multi-year deal that will kick in next year. At Nike, we believe in the power of sport to move the world forward, and that starts with kids, said Nike VP of Global Kids, Cal Dowers, adding, we're excited to invite all kids into a new vision of sport and creative play. If my kids and their friends are any indication, kids these days mostly don't care about Nike, but they do love Legos. The college football season will be the first in which we can actually see the effects of realignment. Meanwhile, NIL is shifting how programs operate, and some of the most prominent programs of the last decade are in moments of transition. I spoke to Sports Grid's Ben Stevens on all of that and plenty more. I'm joined now by Ben Stevens, host of College Football Today, among other shows at Sports Grid. Welcome, Ben. Owen, thank you for having me here. Very excited for the start of 2024, a new era in college football. Yeah, so um, th- this is very much a new era. And actually, let- let's start there because, you know, this is the year where re- we are going to feel the effects of realignment. Obviously, it's been a huge story for a couple of years now, but now we're, we're really facing it. Who in the college football world is really going to be feeling this the most? I think really everywhere, Owen, when you look at the power conference level, as we say goodbye to the Pac-12, the dissolution of what was once coined the Conference of Champions is no more. So you take all the schools that were the banner programs of that league that has been a consistent in college football for half a century, if not beyond that, and now have dispersed them in various leagues around the country. All of conference realignment, though, as you well know, has really been started by the two banner programs of the Big 12, leaving for the SEC, Oklahoma and Texas, making that a highly competitive product, both on the football field and, of course, very enticing to television partners as well. The Big Ten is now no longer 10, not 14, like (laughs) it has been for the last 10 years. It is now 18 schools as you add in the four West Coast newcomers of Oregon, UCLA, USC, and Washington. And then the leftover schools from the Pac-12 making their way to the Big 12, the four corner schools in Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah. We've got schools from the Pacific Coast now in the Atlantic Coast Conference with Cal and Stanford and a school in the heart of Texas in Dallas, SMU, joining it there. So it's a very different climate. It's a very different landscape. Everything will look new in college football. The games will have a bigger bigger magnitude. What we expect out of these teams, what is considered success, will be different. And the overall landscape has greatly changed entering 2024. With change, it could take a while to get used to, Owen, yeah. or it can be a very exciting thing we shall see this season. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And yeah, we essentially have four like pretty national conferences now. The, the regional thing is... It's still kind of there, but not really. Um, do you think this is going to, I mean, we've made a lot of like the travel and, you know, is that going to affect recruiting? Do you think this is actually going to be a big deal once it gets going or will, you know, will that part kind of settle in? 
Yeah, college football has been such a unique product for so many years because of its regionality, because of how geographic it can be. You don't often care if you live in the Midwest what's happening with schools that used to be in the Pac-12 or except out of the rivalry of what's a better league, the Big Ten or the SEC, what things are going on down there. Now it is kind of trying to stake your flag in what is the premier conference in college football. In terms of recruiting those developments, no, it's so national and has been for such a long time. But there is the idea that you're going to get some of that West Coast talent now because the Pac-12 is no longer in different conferences. The SEC now has an even, even stronger footing in what is probably the best high school state in the country, that being Texas. A&M was in the SEC for quite some time, but now you have the standard in Texas that is the Longhorns football program. So that will change ever so slightly, but recruiting really has been a national phenomenon for many, many years. We'll see how it plays out moving forward and as it continues in college football. But in terms of the national landscape, it's kind of been that way. If you have seen past the facade of the amateurism of college football, as we've known, it's been big business for quite some time. Right. I think everyone but the NCAA sees past that facade. Um, And of course, that's not enough changes for one year. So we also have the 12 team uh, college football playoff format coming in, going up from four. That's going to be a massively different product. Do you think, um, I guess we, we can take kind of the fan and media side of this and the, the program side of this separately. Do you think programs are going to be behaving any differently in, in any way because of this, this new format or, or, you know, is it still just, they're just trying to win as many games as they can? Yeah, it's still trying to win, obviously, as many games as you can. But, Owen, when you think about it, the standard of success and the minimum that you need to hit is now very, very different than the four-team college football playoff era, that decade, the BCS era, when magazine writers used to vote on who the national champion would be. In the 10-year history of the college football playoff, where it was just four schools, we never, not once in the 10 years, did we see a team have two losses or more reach the college football playoff. This year, with expansion to 12 schools, schools making the CFP we are going to see multiple teams with multiple losses get into the college football playoff field some that were anti-expansion worried if that would tamper down the significance if you will of regular season games because regular season games in college football almost acted as playoff games even as early as September I who have been very pro-expansion for many years think it actually adds significance to the regular season because you can schedule non-conference games that are going to be huge marquee matchups. And if you lose that football game as a premier football program, it's not slim to none. Your chances of reaching the college football playoff anymore, you still have something to fight for each and every year. Even if you have a slip up early in September or October, your season is not done. The margin of error is a little bit higher, but it keeps it competitive all throughout the regular season. So from the program side of things, I actually think it opens up and changes how we view these colleges in terms of their win-loss record and what success really looks like. Yeah, yeah, it should be interesting. Um, And do you think we're going to stick with 12 for a while or is 16 teams, the 16-game format coming soon? Yeah, as soon as they announced that this would be the first year of 12, they were already meeting in Grapevine, Texas to talk about the feasibility of upping it to 14 schools or 16 schools or models moving forward. I think, Owen, at least for the next few years, we will see it at 12. The biggest thing being in 2026, when the new rights deal comes up for the college football playoff, if there is some more brokering there, we did get some reports earlier this offseason that ESPN had maintained its ownership of the college football playoff product. If that does go out to other programs and networks, those we're already seeing in 2024, TNT is going to broadcast a couple of the early round, opening round college football playoff games. If you have the other big stakeholder in college football in terms of TV rights revenue, Fox get involved in the college football playoff and you need all of that college football television product to expand. I think that could lead to the expansion of the college football playoff, but probably not for at least the next few years. We'll get comfortable with 12, I would say, for at least three to five college football seasons and see what is in store beyond that. Yeah. And, you know, since you bring up ESPN and Fox, I, you know, it's just kind of checking in on the ACC lawsuit just to see if there's anything new there. And of course, ESPN is actively involved in that litigation. And I, I just, it, it sort of struck me about how um, the the media partners here are, just feel very intertwined. I mean, obviously they are in every major sport they broadcast, but in a way where it feels like 
they're going to have a seat at the table when it comes to things like, are we expanding to 16 teams? How do you feel about just the, yeah, the role of like ESPN and Fox uh, when it comes to defining the college football landscape? Yeah, I think it's the reality of the situation. Owen. I think a lot of college football fans fail to recognize that and not to their fault necessarily, but that is why we see all of the changes that we do. TV revenue is the economic engine that drives college football and thus has ramifications not just for college football or big-time men's and women's basketball. It is what we have seen now as these conferences realign and everything has changed for every sport. I think we'll get to a stage probably within the next decade or 15 years where Fox and ESPN and the huge television partners are maybe only interested in power conference games and that being the biggest thing where we have a separation of a semi-professional division of power conference schools and group of five schools where there's still a television product for the group of five but that's kind of going to be the mold of how these television networks will sit at these brokering tables with conferences with the college football playoff and all that goes into the governing bodies around college football because it is very unique the fbs national championship the college football playoff national championship is the only collegiate national championship d1 d2 d3 that the ncaa is not responsible for handing out which allows college football to kind of regulate its own terms. And I think the TV networks are going to have a huge say in how that continues to develop over the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. I want to zoom in on a few individual programs. We got uh, some news that uh, Kirk Ferentz, the Iowa coach, has been suspended for a single game uh, for recruiting violations around Cade McNamara. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are here, because it's a suspension, but it's nothing close to like a Harbaugh situation. Yeah, we're not entirely sure if this is self-imposed from Iowa's athletics department in the NCAA investigation that suspended Kirk Ferentz and wide receiver coach John Budmayer for that opening game against Illinois State, or if it is related directly to the NCAA handing out discipline and punishment of its own investigation. This is something we're going to see, though, Owen, in the next few years as they try to ramp up their guardrails against transfer portal and NIL violations and try to have some sort of teeth in terms of what they can do from a disciplinary arm, I think it's an easy way for Iowa to say, all right, season opener against FCS opponent, although the Hawkeyes would never admit this, that our guy Kirk Ferentz is not going to be out there to start off his 26th college football season as the longest tenured head coach. But we're going to see it in many different avenues. It's why we saw Jim Harbaugh suspended for his first suspension of 2023, that three-game set to start off the year. Recruiting violations are always going to be a part of the game, even as the evolutions in college football change, where you have NIL and the transfer portal. They are still going to continue to investigate these violations, and there will be discipline. Is it the biggest deal? No. Will Kirk Ferentz being suspended for a game send shockwaves around the Big Ten or college football and try to you know hamper coaches from doing the same thing? Absolutely not. It's been a story of the sport for, for many, many years, and will continue that way. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, the recruiting's always been a little Wild Westy, and yep. especially, I mean, in the pre-NIL era, there's, I think, a lot of, you know, handshake kind of deals. Mm -hmm. um, as we move into paying players, it'll just be interesting to see, you know, it, it, does it just bring everything above board, or does it bring a lot of stuff above board, and then there's going to be another level of, like, you know, there's still some like kind of NIL deals where it's like you get $10 million above board and then 20 million. Um, I mean, maybe those numbers are a little off base, but like, yeah. you know, something like that, where it's, right. you know, like NILs you know, could be even bigger uh, in this era. I, it, I don't know if you have any instincts around that, but um, yeah. it would be interesting to see. It will be really interesting. I don't know if we're going to get direct payment to players, but that is the next stage of this process where, oh, we've talked about the TV networks and the revenue and the fact that the Big Ten has a seven-year, $7 billion deal with Fox and its television partners. I think revenue sharing is the next model. It might start for the bigger programs, even within their own leagues, within their own conferences, trying to kind of have those degrees of separation. And then I think we'll see some direct payments to players in the next few years in terms of the revenue sharing model that we have seen with all the legislation, the NCAA versus House court case, all of that good stuff. It's going to continue to change. And does that then diminish what the NCAA can even do in terms of its disciplinary action? I would say so. I think, again, if you're a college football realist and you understand what is happening, 
the reasons this happens is because there's been a lot of stuff that has been kept in the dark rooms that has been taboo for many years that is now starting to emerge. And there will be violations that will be punished, but I think they will lessen over the years. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And yeah, my question was sort of like taking the house settlement as like a done yeah. deal when obviously it's not yet. Still, yeah. still some dominoes to fall there. Uh, let's finish up with, you know, there's some major programs that are in major transition moments. I'm thinking mostly of Alabama with Nick Saban, obviously Harbaugh's on his way out, some others. Um, but yeah, with the Saban example, I mean, he he's such a unique figure. Do you think that program, I mean, obviously there's going to be some amount of transition, but I also feel like we're in this era where these programs are so big and like it, it wasn't just Nick Saban at this point that he's got a whole infrastructure. Do you yeah. think we're going to see major changes in Alabama? Uh, I don't really. I mean, it's tough when Nick Saban has set such a strong standard where if you lose even one game, it is seen as the end of an era. But Nick Saban was there for 17 years and won six national championships at Alabama to replicate that level of success even for the best coaches currently in college football, is very difficult to do. Kalen DeBoer, I think, will have great success in Tuscaloosa, but it might be a resetting of expectation for the Crimson Tide. People forget this, Owen, but in the 10 years prior to Nick Saban taking over in 2007, gassed, Alabama lost, uh, had a losing season four of those 10 years, which wow. now sounds unthinkable to many yeah. that have grown up knowing Alabama under Nick Saban as the premier program in college football. Even Saban's first year, they only won seven games. So it will be a reset of expectation, but kind of going back to our conversation about the changes from a program perspective to the college football playoff, if Alabama goes 10 and two, or if Alabama goes nine and three throughout the regular season and their losses are not poor and it's hard to find bad losses now in a stacked SEC, there's a great chance Alabama can make the college football playoffs still. So it's a resetting of expectation both nationally and, of course, in the huge changes that have happened in Tuscaloosa. To fill the shoes of Nick Saban is very, very difficult, but I do believe Kalen DeBoer will have some success in Tuscaloosa from the very start. All right. Should be fun to watch. Ben Stevens, thanks so much for joining us. Owen, thanks for having me. Before we go, here's Minnesota Timberwolves guard Anthony Edwards freestyling about winning a gold medal in Paris. Bet with my gold medal. Bet with my gold fellas. Me and my nigga, we like the Rockefeller. No Jay-Z. Don't oh, forget to pay me. I think the last two games, I was about like Curry. That's it for today. College football is here and the NFL is coming, so make sure you are subscribed to Front Office Sports Today so you don't miss a thing. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. See you on Monday.